The talk tonight is entitled William Golding, Lord of the Flies and Beyond. And I believe I'm handing over to Nick in the first instance. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, for that wonderful introduction. And he's always the hardest act to follow, I should know, although he did follow me winning Teacher of the Year because I won it the year before, <laughs> just to remind him of that moment. Um, welcome, it's so lovely to see you on this gloriously hot day. I also want to give just a very special hello to my daughter, Courtney, who is online um, and joining us from a university. So I'm very happy she's there. When Ian um, invited Judy and I to give this talk, he asked us when we would like to come. And we said September. And that's because September is a really important month for William Golding. It marks his birthday. He would have been 112 this year. For those of you with maths not as quick, um, 1911. It's also the date of his wedding to Judy's mother, Anne, who was an enormous influence on his writing. And I think it's absolutely true to say that we would not have these novels without the input of Judy's mother. September also marked the birth of his first child, David, Judy's brother. September is also when his first novel, Lord of the Flies, was published. Followed a year later, almost exactly to the day, by his second book, The Inheritors. And the Inheritors was actually Golding's favourite of all his novels. Lord of the Flies was published in 1954. There's an image there of the first edition. That's 69 years ago. And this astonishing novel is still read by millions of people every year. It's been translated into almost every language you can think of. It's themes of the breakdown of civilization, democratic failure, war, violence, feel sadly as relevant now as it did then back in the 50s. Despite publishing many other novels, he won the Booker in 1980 for Rites of Passage, the James Tate Memorial Prize for Darkness Visible, and of course, the Nobel Prize for Literature. Golden's career is defined by his debut. This is not a fact that escaped Golding. In his dark comedy, The Paper Men, published in 1984, Golding plays with his readers, by seemingly weaving in autobiographical elements. The paper men tells the story of Wilf Barclay, a curmudgeonly writer who is best known for writing his first and most celebrated book. Barclay is pursued across Europe by an academic, Rick Tucker. This is not a nice book to read as a professor of English literature. And Tucker is just desperate for his papers to write his biography. And both men are driven to the brink of madness by this cat and mouse chase. Barclay tells Tucker, you don't know about my life. You aren't going to either. And here's where Golding goes, as we might say, meta. The novel plays with truth and artifice. Is Will Barclay William Golding? Absolutely not. Because the realism in this novel gives way to dreamlike sequences and unexplainable and extraordinary occurrences. Thus, the seemingly autobiographical resonances of Golding's life are playfully rejected. And the reader can almost hear Golding's mischievous giggle as he writes in the novel, This Isn't a Biography. Now, many of you who think you know William Golding may not have expected a mischievous giggle from such a writer. Um, some of the later novels absolutely play with this idea of comedy. Although Golden found such success, as I say, he entirely uh, you know, is known for Lord of the Flies. At the time of his death, Golden left more than 1 million words in unpublished journals. And in 1983, he tries to ponder upon what makes a successful novel. How can he write yet another successful novel? He says that it's possible that a lasting novel one people will go back to, or at the least accept as part of the furniture of their minds, must have the quality of daily living in it. That is somehow we must know the world goes on and these people to not exist just to make a story vanishing before, after and between the events. 
how simple, how impossible. But the power of the debut, a novel that has appeared on countless school curricula around the world. I might just do this very quickly. Raise your hand if you studied Lord of the Flies at school. Points answered there. Yeah. Um, he was a school teacher when he wrote this book. Of course, how perfect for a school teacher to reveal what boys could be like. And we imagine him scribbling in school exercise books as he taught, not just in the breaks. And he actually asked his pupils to count the words in his manuscripts. Maybe not join lessons, of course, but absolutely they were aware of his scribblings. Through the success of his writing in the early 1960s, he was able to give up teaching and become a full-time writer. Although he ruefully, but I think cheerfully, wrote in Fable an essay that the success of Lord of the Flies amongst young people in particular ensured that students continually wrote to him to ask questions and that he should be treated for the rest of his days as a schoolmaster. So why has this book, soon to reach his 70th year of publication, endured? One of the key attractions of Lord of the Flies is its relevance in contemporary politics. And I think I could speak that sentence in any year in history since the publication of that book. Indeed, it is much at the level of something like 1984 in that Lord of the Flies is frequently used as a reverent when discussing forms of societal breakdowns and disruptions to democracy. In the last 10 years, it seems our world has become ever more polarized with seemingly impossible to breach divisions and a lack of nuance in political discussions. You are one or you are the other. Lord of the Flies was particularly mentioned in the reporting of the US presidential election in 2016 and the EU referendum vote in the UK. Both Donald Trump and Theresa May were described in the, pre in the press as conch smashers in reference to golden symbol of democratic process. So if you held the conch in Lord of the Flies, you were permitted to talk. So as a conch smasher, you aren't speaking when you should not. Boris Johnson's proroguing of parliament in 2019, found later to be illegal by the Supreme Court, is yet another example of the disruption of democracy mirrored in Jack's, in the novel, eventual refusal to attend camp meetings when he couldn't get his own way. I'm not going to play any longer, not with you. The attack on the US Capitol building in 2021 starkly demonstrates the danger presented by a leader that refuses to yield power. One of the reasons I think Lord of the Flies enjoys is those characters, Higgy, Ralph, Jack, and I think um, in my role with William Golding Limited, Simon comes up time and time again as someone who is almost universally loved. And of course, Simon and Piggy, spoiler alert, are both killed in the book, but they represent reason and truth on the island. Simon is the only boy to understand the truth behind the beast. He argues that the beast exists only within humans, Hence, there is no darker force at work. When he sees that the embodiment of the beast is simply a dead parachutist, he is beaten to death by the boys before he can explain this. Piggy frequently begs for order and reason. He says, which is better, law and re rescue, or hunting and breaking things up? But he is, his ideas, his ways to respond to situations are drowned out by dissent and bullying, and eventually, he is completely silenced when a huge rock pushed by Roger precipitates his death. This willful hostility to reasonable and logical arguments as portrayed by Golding seems to me reminiscent of global political conflicts. During the debates leading up to the EU referendum, Michael Gove stated, I think people in this country have had enough of experts dismissing a range of commentators who are arguing that if the e UK left the EU, it would be disastrous for the economy and possibly for human rights. In the US election campaign in that same year, Hillary Clinton was derided by Trump for preparing herself with factual evidence 
for the televised debates. In both these examples, we can see logic and reason are willfully denied or pointedly ridiculed in support of a political result. I suppose my, my next part is kind of ironic as we are all incredibly hot in this room. But one of our main points of polarization we see in the world now is the climate crisis and the idea of what is causing um, some of our extremes of weather. And I think that this is one of the perhaps less discussed themes in Lord of the Flies and seems to me perhaps the most important theme for us to think about in 2023. Golding wrote Lord of the Flies after the end of the Second World War. So he wrote it in 1952, and, and the story is very well known about how many publishers rejected it. Um, and during the early years of the Cold War, in um, one of the manuscripts, the opening of the novel actually displays a nuclear uh, atomic battle, um, a big battle, um, which was excised in the published version. But we know this happened because Piggy says to Ralph early on, didn't you hear what the pilot said about the atom bomb? They're all dead. Thus the threat of nuclear annihilation haunts this story from the beginning. And we see a subtle link to it in the boy's own behavior. As they explore the island, they push a large rock off a cliff which smashes a deep hole in the canopy of the forest. Wacko, they exclaim, like a bomb. Their excitement in this act of destruction is an uncomfortable moment as it reminds us of the ruin caused by the nuclear bomb. Golding wrote, you know, Golding's often typed as a, a pessimist, but he wrote that the main pleasure of writing Lord of the Flies was the description, his imagination of being present on that coral island. And indeed, Golding presents a beautiful landscape entirely untouched by humans until the boys arrived. I won't read all of the quotation now. I'm going to read just a little bit um, before this. The shore was fledged with palm trees. These stood or leaned or reclined against the light and their green feathers were a hundred feet up in the air. The ground beneath them was a bank covered with coarse grass torn everywhere by the upheavals of fallen trees scattered with decaying coconuts and palm saplings. And then he moves on to the destruction, the scar, which represents the crash. The island is a world dominated by nature and by the animals who live on the island who quickly become prey to the boys. And I think one thing that's often missed in, in these kind of mentions of Lord of the Flies in adaptations and inspirations is that the boys don't struggle to survive in terms of food or water. They have plenty it's not a, a question of desperately hunting for food. Golding has provided with food. So it's quite different than from some of the, the kind of pieces that have since been inspired by it. But they begin with destruction. As the boys take over, not only do they cause the scar throughout the jungle, they have a further negative effect on its ecosystem a subtle change is in the insects. Golden describes the abundance of butterflies in the early stages of the book. The air was thick with butterflies, lifting, fluttering, settling. By the time Jack displays a pig's head on a stick, who of course becomes known as the Lord of the Flies, the butterflies have been replaced in the stifling heat by the stench of decay. Nothing prospered but the flies who blackened their lord and made the spilt guts look like a heap of glistening coal. The two fires on the island, I think very significant in exploring Golden's theme of environmental destruction. In the second chapter, very early on, the boys light a fire which spirals quickly out of control with fatal consequences. As the flames destroy the surrounded flora and fauna, Piggy comments wryly, you got your small fire all right. The boy's thoughtlessness is the first act of destruction and death, but not, of course, the last. In the final terrifying chase of Ralph, Jack orders his group to smoke him out of the hiding place. Smoke was seeping through the branches in white and yellow wisps, the patch of blue sky overhead, 
turned to the colour of a storm cloud and then the smoke billowed round him. In their desperation to catch Ralph, they set the entire island alight without considering their survival. Ralph thinks to himself, the fruit must be almost at the fruit trees. What would they eat tomorrow? These damaging blows to nature are similar to the devastating fires that we have experienced this year and several years um, up to where we are now. The fires as a product of the warming climate and the destruction of nature for human gain are paralleled in the novel. Just as Jack wants the forest burned for his short-term gain, the 2023 wildfires represents a similar kind of recklessness. If the environmental crisis continues, humanity's long-term survival is very much at risk. In Lord of the Flies, Golden shows how easy it is for humans to threaten nature and the Earth's endurance, both on the small scale microcosm of the island and in the wider world destroyed by nuclear war. In his following novel, The Inheritors, Golding explored a somewhat similar theme with a battle for survival, but also a love and desire to protect nature. The first draft was written in an astonishing 29 days, and it's typical for all Golding's novels, transports the reader to yet another world in yet another time of history. When Golding's editor at Faber and Faber, Charles Monteith, received the manuscript, he noticed that he said to himself, first it was schoolboys, now it's cavemen, bloody cavemen. Golden's group of Neanderthal people are threatened by the emergence of Homo sapiens, who seek to destroy and cannibalize them. Golden's Neanderthals do not hunt, and they're intrigued by the visitors because they simply have no concept of fear. They have respect and wonder at the natural world. In the opening of the book, the people return to their cave after the winter. There is joy here, joy in the lighting of a controlled fire and in the coming of spring, which they attribute to their goddess, Oe. Of course, since this is us who are sitting here now, we know the inevitable fate of the Neanderthal people. However, despite the seeming pessimism of both Lord of the Flies and the Inheritors, Golden never forgets to leave us with hope, hope that is so often entangled with nature. And on that note, I'm delighted to introduce Judy. I've just been told I haven't got the microphone quite where, where it should be. Can I just check if um, people can hear me? Because I don't have a very strong voice. Thank you. And good evening. And it's lovely to be here. And my two introducers have been very, very kind to me. And sorry, I moved that I was saying they were very kind. Uh, I'd also like to say um, that my father uh, was very fond of Bath. For a long time, we lived near Salisbury, and Bath was on our kind of beaten track of places we would take visitors, especially American visitors, actually. We would take them to Stonehenge, Salisbury Cathedral, perhaps Old Sarum, uh, possibly Longleat, but certainly Bath. And actually, my father would then seize an opportunity to sneak off into the Abbey, not, I think, to... Um, engage in uh, prayer, though possibly, I don't know, but because he loved all the monuments there. He loved to walk around and read the monuments. And he claimed that there was a monument to a young lady who had died of excessive sensibility. And I must admit, I've never found that, um, that, um, uh, that uh, particular monument. I think like um, as, uh, uh, oh, goodness, what's her name? Catherine Morland in Northanger Abbey says of history, a great deal of it must be invention. So, Lord of the Flies. It's so successful. I mean, you know, I we owe an enormous amount, not only to the novel, but to Charles Monteith, whom Nicola mentioned, who took it off the reject pile and saw something in it and... and 
mentored it. But because it's so successful, I think people think of it as the quintessential Golding novel. And actually, I don't think that's so, partly because it was very, very extensively edited by Charles, actually. Um, and in later life, my father rather regretted that the emphasis in Lord of the Flies had shifted and that in particular, he had been persuaded to take out quite a lot of the stuff about Simon in particular that showed another side to life on the island, uh, a side of mis mystery and miraculous appearances. Um, he cut many passages about Simon and also he cut quite a lot of Simon's appreciation of the natural world, which as Nicola says, is a very important part of that novel, I think. And I think this means, well, I should say, first of all, you know, it was clearly a good decision. The novel has gone on to mean a great deal to a great many people, and who knows, it may even have, you know, dissuaded some people from becoming fascists. I don't know. I mean, you know, one can only hope. Um, so from the pragmatic point of view and the aesthetic point of view, it was clearly a good decision. I think it had the result that my father's later novels searched for some of that aspect and produced it. And as Nicola says, in The Paper Men, there are many um, inexplicable and what we might describe as miraculous um, events. Uh, also, the choice my father made has led, I think, to Lord of the Flies being seen primarily as um, as a comment on human society and human nature, whereas I think my father undoubtedly he meant that. He said that. He says he wrote it in response to the events of the Second World War. And in fact, he said the subject was grief, grief, grief. Um, I don't know about that, but I do know that he really also meant the novel to show something about the contact of human beings with another another world. Now, I've just remembered I should um, show you a few slides. I wanted to start off with this one because everyone sees my father as a gray bearded, solemn old man. And he wasn't a solemn old man at all, actually. I mean, he was a very, um, uh, he, he was uh, a very funny man, but also as a child, he was exceptionally rumbustious, I think, much loved. My grandfather talks about him being a very affectionate child and you don't get to be an affectionate child, I think, unless you're, you're treated well. So that's my father with his brother, Jose, at the age of approximately three. I'm not quite sure, but it's, I think he's really wearing a dress, actually, if you look carefully possibly for the last time in his life. Now, famously, um, my father was a school teacher, a profession he viewed ambiguously, I think. He says in Lord of the Flies that the Lord of the Flies spoke in the voice of a schoolmaster. Uh, there he is in a school photograph for Bishop Wordsworth School. Um, it's about 1954. I don't know exactly the date, honestly but there he is in the serried ranks of um, staff and schoolboys. Now, I want to talk a bit about a recent study of his work, which has shifted the emphasis a little bit and wants to show the importance in his novels of the quality that I think he cut out of Lord of the Flies. Uh, and this is um, a thesis by somebody called Bradley Osborne, now Dr. Bradley Osborne. Um, and I'm going to quote, well, I better tell you, actually, the title of his thesis is wonderful, uh, Disenchantment and Reenchantment in the Work of William Golding. I gather that disenchantment and reenchantment actually have a technical literary meaning, but I, in any case, I think that's a wonderful um, piece of uh, resonance, really, she said, properly. Thing. Um, and he says that he wants to put forward the idea that my father aimed, quote, to reawaken in his readers 
a sense of mystery in the world. And he talks about a se the sense of a strange and unsettling reality created by some parts of my father's writing. And I think admirably, I must say this, though I feel it's not meant to apply to uh, present persons. He wanted to shake up the ossified state of Golding scholarship as it currently stands. And I think, you know, we can all um, see the, the uh, excitement in that. Now, if we look beyond Lord of the Flies at the um, investigation my father makes into these the, the sort of otherworldly qualities, um, one thing that is always there is ambiguity. So in The Spire, my father's fifth novel, published in 1964, which is um, a not at all disguised portrait of Salisbury Cathedral, uh, the Dean, Jocelyn, uh, has what he thinks is a vision from God telling him to put the spire on the cathedral. But um, do we believe that? Or do we think it's a narcissistic um, explosion of paranoia or something? In Darkness Visible, published in 1979, what about the miraculous, almost psychedelic appearance of the saintly and recently deceased Matty uh, to uh, an extremely unpleasant character called Pedigree? Is this really a vision or is it the dying man's last gasp? And centrally, for our discussion tonight in Lord of the Flies, does Simon really talk to the Lord of the Flies or is he merely having a seizure? So, next slide. In The Double Tongue, my father's final novel, which was published posthumously in 1995, the ambiguity around the presence of the mysterious is explored by the narrator herself, female. She's the Pythia, the priestess of Apollo in his shrine at Delphi in Greece, living in the century before the birth of Christ. She's presented with a particular problem. She's meant to give answers from the God to questions put to her by the faithful, but she knows that some of these are faked by her mentor and helper, the priest Ionides. And that's the quote, Ionides saying, oh, no, 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 heavens, no, goodness, would I do a thing like that? But on the other hand, she does seem to have some otherworldly qualities. She's done a number of things that has frightened her very much as a, as a child and young woman. She's healed people, restored cooked fish to life, and possibly saved the life of a sick child. And the, the rumors about this make the people in charge of Apollo's shrine at Delphi, uh, including Ionides, they make her um, a possible recruit and she is taken up to Delphi to learn how to be, how to be a prophetess. Ionides, in fact, thinks she has what he refers to as qualities lying dormant. Uh, and I think the idea of qualities lying dormant is actually a very good description of the way my father puts these mysterious elements in his novel. But she's frightened of these abilities, and I think that's very interesting because my father, while very interested in the mysterious, was also very frightened by the uncanny. And as a person with a powerful imagination, he was very good at conjuring up a sense of the uncanny. In fact, he was too good for his own personal comfort, and this lasted all his life till he was an old man. Um, he was extremely frightened of the dark, and it would color the later part of the day for him while he was a child, as he became more and more aware of the terrors. Now, I wanted to illustrate this, and of course, it's difficult. Here is a drawing of their home, drawn by my beloved grandfather. And as you can see, it's a really nice, interesting house. Um, my father hated it, was frightened of it, refused to buy it after his parents died. They always rented it from the council and quarreled with his brother on that basis. He said, I always hated that house. And here, luckily, is a photograph that I think gives you an idea of the way he felt. And actually, I must say, this made him very sympathetic to me as a child when I too suffered such terrors. 
he was patient to a remarkable degree. I can still remember him appearing, you know, after I... Um, and I've been told that I would usually greet him with the explanation, Daddy, I've had a nasty thought. And I think he actually knew exactly what I meant. Now, in my father's fourth novel, Free Fall, there is the cover of it. I'm going to return to that cover later, which may seem to you rather enigmatic. In my father's fourth novel, Free Fall, uh, which is another partly autobiographical but skewed work, the narrator himself, who's a painter called Sammy, observes two paths or worlds, one of religious belief and acknowledgement of the mysterious, the other of scientific explanation and rationality. For my father, the world of science and rationality had the strong attraction of being the world his father inhabited as a scientist. And I put one quote up there, but there is another one from the same, to communicate is our passion and our despair. And the novel in a sense is, is all about that. It sounds very jolly, it's quite funny actually. My father was trained as a scientist and admitted that he had partly taken that path to please his father. He did two years of a science degree at Oxford before changing to English literature. And all his life, he was actually very, very interested in science. And I think seems to have regarded it as a very creative subject. Um, he loved the space race. And also one of his great friends was a man called James Lovelock, who was a tremendously interesting, imaginative and creative scientist. Now, in Lord of the Flies, the world of rationality is represented by Piggy. I had a really odd experience about this when I, I went to the Cheltenham Festival, I was in the audience, and one of the speakers was Melvin Bragg. And he said, well, I've always thought that Piggy was based on Golding's father, Alec. And I should have brought you a photograph. He had little round specks. Um, and when I heard that, there was a sort of click in my brain and I realized I'd always sort of thought that, but I'd never actually articulated it. But I'm sure Piggy and my grandfather have a very close link. So for example, in the meeting about ghosts, who believes in ghosts, which they unwisely have rather late in the evening when it's getting dark and they're getting a bit edgy. Um, Piggy stoutly says, I don't believe in no ghosts. Questioned by Ralph, he produces a good argument. If ghosts did exist, other things, TV sets, for example, wouldn't work. I remember my grandfather making much the same argument in an attempt to talk me out of my night terrors. I'm pretty sure he put the same argument to my father too. And for a while, I think this sufficed for my father, loyal to his father's creed. But somehow that world on its own deprived him of something. And at Oxford also, he experienced science very, very differently. Alec um, was a born teacher. And since his school, it was a small country grammar school, um, was very poor, they couldn't afford scientific equipment. And so he would mime experiments. Um, I remember my father telling me about these three bowls that he mimed, uh, one with hot water, one with cold water, and one with tepid water, and how he showed you by miming that if you put your hands in the hot water um, and then in the tepid, it would feel cold. But if, obviously, you get the point. But the point for my father was that at the age of 70, he could still record actually seeing these three bowls up in the air with his father dipping his hands in them. But once he went to Oxford, um, science became rather sort of gray and dead. And unfortunately, his um, teacher was a professor, uh, Frederick Lindemann, who later actually was his boss during the war but who was famous for his incredibly tedious lectures and people were, you know, well known for falling asleep or pretending to fall asleep, you know, the undergraduates kind of going sort of 
snooze on the um, bench in front of him to try to make him jolly things up. Um, but in the end, my father decided he couldn't stand it anymore. And he persuaded his parents to let him change to English to have another year at Oxford, which was no small thing for them. They weren't at all well off. And he did a three-year degree in two years. And he also, at that time, became a sailor. And I think the world of science and cause and effect is quite important. You know, you do things as a sailor because you know that something else will follow. It's a world, a world of forces and harnessing those forces to make the boat go the way you want. But also, sailors, I don't know if you've noticed this, are extremely superstitious. And my father was no exception, actually. He was ludicrously superficial, uh, superstitious to the extent that he would translate Hello, Mr. Magpie into French when we went to France. Now, Dr. Osborne, whom I haven't talked about enough, um, discusses an episode described by my father in the draft of a radio play. In it, a sailor based on my father has an otherworldly experience after he has a head injury. You might think this was hedging his bets, but actually I think he's exploring a world beyond that. I think the physical and the mysterious are occurring at the same moment, and I think the combination becomes the opposite of trivial. In free fall, the two worlds are represented for the narrator, the painter Sammy, by two of his teachers. One is the kindly patient science teacher, Nick Shales, based on Golding's father, my grandfather, Alec, and who was also his science teacher. And here, I'm proud to say, is a photograph of him in the school lab. And actually, he looks perhaps quite grim there, but actually, I think you could tell by the fact the pupil is quite close to him and they're both concentrating that he was actually a very good teacher and people, children, responded to him. And actually, um, it's quite moving the way he's described in Free Fall. Um, he died just before the book was published. He died in 1958, and the book was published in spring 1959. Um, the, other, the other world is represented by a woman called Rowena Ping Pringle, Sammy's RE teacher at the school and a devout Christian, but an unkind and even cruel person. And my dad refers to the person he based her on as my most hated teacher. And then I want to read this quote. Uh, it's, uh, I hope, for an instant, uh, it's from Freefall. For an instant out of time, the two worlds existed side by side. The one I inhabited by nature, the world of miracle, drew me strongly. To give up the burning bush, the water from the rock, the spittle on the eyes, was to give up a portion of myself, a dark and inward and fruitful portion. Yet looking at me from the bush was the fat and freckled face of Miss Pringle. The other world, the cool and reasonable, was home to the friendly face of Nick Shales. I hung for an instant between two pictures of the universe. Then the ripple passed over the burning bush and I ran towards my friend. I'm, Free Fall is a rather unread un novel. It's a, probably the Cinderella of all my father's novels. And it always strikes me reading bits from it that the writing is absolutely astonishing. Um, and, you know, that's partly why I decided I'd go into it. So Sammy runs towards his friend, but nevertheless, that world is a deprivation and something that removes part of himself. Later in Sammy's life, circumstances cause him to change. He's in a prisoner of war camp in the Second World War, and he's released suddenly without warning from a terrifying imprisonment, a form of mental torture, really in solitary darkness. And when he emerges, he has a kind of epiphany. And that's what the cover means. That's him being all 
that the open door of the um, imprisonment. And I mention it partly because this is, there have been a lot of covers of all my father's books, tremendous numbers, and a free fall included. Uh, and that is the first time anyone has bothered to portray the central see scene of the book. And I think it's the most arresting cover. So after this epiphany, he walks around the prison camp in a bewildered state of a kind of um, sort of cleansed awareness. It's as if he's seeing everything new, as if he's sort of newborn. Um, and as an artist, he in that state, he does his best work. He does some drawings of his companions in the prison as um, some cigarette cards that he has a as a child called the Kings of Egypt. And it's a remarkable work and it goes into the Tate and everything like that. And there's this description of it. And I think the fearlessness of my father trying to describe the indescribable is really remarkable. And I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. Standing between the understood huts among jewels and music, I was visited by a flake of fire, miraculous and Pentecostal. This state doesn't last forever, but while it does, he's in a different world, one where he does some of his best work. And Sammy himself comes to the stark conclusion, both words, worlds are real, there is no bridge. Is he right? Does the author agree? Can we imagine a bridge and does Golding ever show one? Now, next slide. I don't know whether it's true or not. Anyway, for Golding, perhaps the mysterious is an occasional lucky glimpse. Jocelyn in the spa as he lies ill and dying, in fact, after all the really bad things he's done and the terrible hurt he's caused. He uses, for example, he uses an adulterous relationship. This is a man of the church. He uses the fact that the builder has an affair with the wife of the cathedral caretaker. He uses that. He says, she will keep him here. And she does. So he's done terrible things. He's caused dreadful hurt. He's destroyed a number of lives. And on his deathbed, he sees something he takes as a vision, although I think it's quite possibly real, solid, and material. And the text, as often with my dad, can be interpreted in several ways. And he would never say which was true. I think Jocelyn sees in a window the actual built spa, which has cost so much. And I'll read this. Or perhaps I'll skip the first bit, because he sees what looks like two eyes, and then the two eyes slid together. It was the window, bright and open. Something divided it. Round the division was the blue of the sky. The division was still and silent, but rushing upward to some point at the sky's end and with a silent cry. It was slim as a girl, translucent. It had grown from some seed of rose-colored substance that glittered like a waterfall, an upward waterfall. The substance was one thing that broke all the way to infinity in cascades of exaltation that nothing could trammel. So I think for my father, it's a matter of being given the opportunity to perceive and this comes often at a cost. It may not come to your dying like Jocelyn or Pedigree, the man in darkness visible who sees Matty. Or maybe you've sustained a great trauma, physical or in Sammy's case, emotional. Maybe like Simon, your physical condition, epilepsy, gives you a thinner barrier or even a bridge between you and the miraculous. Whatever this is, something momentarily reawakens in you a sense of mystery, of wonder, and possibly of something transcendental, but my dad would never admit to one way or the other. So it is possible the visionary and the actual come together and so inform each other. And I think they certainly are more present 
in my father's novels than you might guess from just a reading of Lord of the Flies. Thank you very much. I should, I should say, I'm terribly sorry that I cut off the top of the spire. I had no idea. So it only went part of the way to infinity. But to, you know, we can imagine. Um, so we will now enter the uh, Q&A. So I'll ask the two speakers to wrestle for control of the lectern or the conch uh, at this particular moment. I will... Uh, um, dash around the room if there are questions here. Um, I will also keep an eye on my phone. Um, if people do want to ask questions here, I will ask that they hold the microphone quite close to their mouth so that people online can hear. Do we have any questions in the room? As the darkness falls, I feel that there's... Um, we have a question in the middle here, so... Hi, um, I was wondering what was uh, Golding's relationship like with his publisher throughout his life? Like, was it just Faber and Faber that he worked with? And it, did they want to edit Lord of the Flies very heavily? And did that damage how he worked with them? I think it's fair to say he had a very good and warm relationship with his publisher, particularly with his editor, Charles Monteith whom he, um, you know, I think they were really close friends. I remember Charles saying to me after my father died, you know, I can't believe it. Um, yes, Lord of the Flies was quite heavily, perhaps heavily is the wrong. Some of the description of Simon's spirituality was excluded, and I think my father regretted that. But there were other bits um, that were cut out, such as, um, as Nicola mentions, the opening and I think closing, no, not closing, there's another bit in the middle, isn't yeah. there? Yeah. Before the airman comes down, um, there were two quite long sections about the war um, that then become non-existent. And you're, you know, as everyone tells you, start in the middle of the story. So he started in the middle of the story. Um, Charles actually says that he didn't edit The Inheritors at all. Um, and I think after that, his role was very much advisory and one of encouragement. So that, for example, he would often read things at a relatively early stage and say, you know, yes, it's wonderful or it's going to be wonderful. Um, and Daddy would go away and do another version. But he was tremendously loyal to Faber and Faber and always felt that they had rescued him from a life of drudgery and enabled him to have the sort of life he wanted where he could write. So, and I think he was quite right to feel that. I think they, they did very well. And also they added a huge dimension to his life in terms of the people he met through, um, through Faber, other writers, um, and other people who worked for the firm. He was great friends with a man called Matthew Evans, who succeeded Charles as, as chairman. So, you know, it was thumbs up for Faber all round. I don't know, do you have? Yeah, I think, um, I think an important thing to note is that Goldin never took an agent. He never had an agent because he trusted Faber and Faber entirely, um, which is really rare, actually, you know, particularly as his career grew and grew. And, Another example, it was interesting, Judy, you talk about the people he got to meet. And this is one of my favourite Golden stories, and I do like to tell it, only because there's an unfortunate parallel in my own life. Um, the first time he met T.S. Eliot, Golden spilt champagne on him. Uh, I also spilt coffee on a deputy vice chancellor once, so I, you know, I, I absolutely get the kind of uh, mortification there. Um, but... The final novel that, that Judy mentioned, actually, The Double Tongue, published posthumously, is actually dedicated to Charles Monteith at Faber. Um, and in that instance, actually, that was the second draft, wasn't it, that was published, and there was actually a third, but they decided to go for the sort of the really unedited one. So um, a really wonderful relationship, I think, with Faber and Faber. And again, even The Lord of the Flies, the, the amount it was edited, the very, very first Golding draft 
actually is much more like the final one. It's the second draft when he adds in some of the extra bits, isn't it, that they then take out. Um, but I think your father did like a comma, didn't he, Judy? And I think uh, Monteith described it as like currants in a loaf. So certainly his comma obsession was something that Monteith absolutely helped with. Also, also, I think it's fair to say that my father's spelling was not his strong point. So there was a, a certain amount of, um, uh, you know, gentle, um, well, considering he's a school teacher, rather surprising. But um, anyway, yes, I think that. Thank you. Very much. I think we all go through that comma stage at some point. Uh, at least I know I did. So I'm glad I'm in good company. Uh, other questions? I have loads myself, so if you don't ask, I will ask, but a question here. There we go. Hi. Um, when William Golding was working on really any of his books, um, when he was, like, you know, out, like, spending time with his family or doing something else, was he constantly thinking about like the novel or the characters or was he or would he like compartmentalize and come back to it later i think that's definitely not for you Judy. fantastic question I th that is a good question and like all good questions it's probably impossible to answer um it seemed to me that my father had a kind of switch that he could use and he would switch on his concentration and I mean, a lorry could have crashed into the house and I don't think he would have noticed. Um, and then he would come out of that and be, you know, with family and play with the grandchildren and things like that. He was a very warm and approachable person, but he felt that there was almost another version of himself that wrote the books. In fact, he, he describes himself um, in the scene in Lord of the Flies where Simon talks to the pig's head he describes himself, and I don't think it's completely ironical, as taking dictation from the Lord of the Flies. So I think there was a, a sort of head down quality that he could do and then, you know, go and lay the table or something like that. So, but who knows what goes on in anybody's head, honestly. But it's a really good question. Thank you. Do you, do you no, I think that. You that beautifully, Judy. Judy, uh, this this follows up on this from uh, uh, Judith on on uh, online, and I, there's 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 probably a three hour answer to this. But picking up on what he was like as a as a father, um, what was domestic life like? Um, well, when I was a small child, about sort of seven, eight, nine, the colourful famous character in our family was my mother, who was very beautiful and very, quite a bit flamboyant, dressed very beautifully. And she was the person who people kind of noticed. She was very um, approachable. And my father, who was never very well dressed, even when he had money, and he didn't have money at this point, um, was probably regarded as rather odd. Um, and I think in a way he was odd, actually. Uh, and also we did a lot of eccentric, thing, eccentric things. We, we didn't have a car, but we had a boat. Um, we lived in council flats until I was 13. Um, and generally, he just sort of got on with things. They did a lot of amdram, actually. The, there was a lot of... And my mother was a very good amateur actress. So to begin with... She was definitely the star. And I think to a certain extent, their places slightly changed as time went on. But she was always very supportive of him. And about home life, I mean, you know, it was just, he was, you know, your dad. Um, and I mean, I would ask him to help me sometimes, so not very much. Um, uh, he couldn't help with maths, that was definite. <laughs> um, yeah, he was, he was, I mean, you know, he was just your dad. Um, everybody knows what that's like, you know. It's, um, and I'm very grateful to him for, for being that because he had, you know, one full-time job. He was a writer as well. 
and he um, did a lot of acting and in between, oh, and he taught for the WEA. Uh, and also, you know, he got up in the middle of the night to tell me, no, that there wasn't a ghost behind the bed. So, <laughs> yeah, he was a nice man. Uh, I've, and I've got one more question uh, um, from a Courtney online. Oh. That may be for me. Yeah. Uh, so, well, I, I don't know. This is, um, uh, I, I confess I wasn't aware of this. Recent news of a new TV adaptation of Lord of the Flies. Uh, and she asks, how did Golding feel about adaptations of his, of his work, um, such as the films? And did he have particular views, requirements? Was he involved in, in, in those adaptations? So who, who's going to answer that? Excellent question. Um... Thank you. Um, so the, the first kind of adaptation that he was actually involved in is the 1963 Peter Brook adaptation, which is absolutely wonderful. And, I, and actually the stories behind this, you know, these are all just boys, they're not actors. Uh, one of them who plays Ralph goes on to become an actor, but for the most part, they're just kids on holiday who, uh, who get kind of pressed into this film. And interesting, I always find, I, I find this really difficult, but the boy who played Piggy was actually bullied by the other boys. And they said, we will kill you for real. Partly, potentially to make them act better or just for general awfulness. So I'm not sure, but Golding loved that adaptation of Peter Brooks' Lord of the Flies. Throughout his lifetime, there's one more adaptation, Harry Hook's 1990 Lord of the Flies, which sets it in America. Uh, I probably won't say too much about his view. Um, he did make a note in his journals, which I won't share with you, but I think it's probably fair to say that wasn't the favorite movie that he he ever had um as as our question online mentions there is uh, going to be a bbc adaptation um and of course you know the world has seen so many imaginations of lord of the flies inspired by judy's favorite she won't mind me saying this is yeah, to be fancy we have to say the peter brook lord of the flies but in reality the best lord of the flies adaptation is actually the simpsons episode which uh, isn't it? It's wonderful, isn't it, Judy? It's uh, it's wonderful. Yes, <laughs> and it I'm, and it's so cleverly done because the place that the children in the Simpsons are going is to the Model UN, which is exactly what happens in Lord of the Flies when we see the naval officer at the end looking back at the wall. So it's a brilliant adaptation, and I think a, a, a more recent and it's not an adaptation it's an inspired by is yellow jackets which is an american tv series and the that they, they crash and it's mostly young women there are some um, young men there but mostly young women and this is very interesting because there's been lots of kind of debates why aren't there any girls in lords of the flies and what would girls do differently and actually what they show in yellow jackets is they'll just they're just going to eat each other um which which i i thought was very good um but gives this these kind of continual perspectives of this novel that you know existed so long ago and continually reimagined and regrown which is wonderful isn't it judy and it's been adapted into a, a ballet ballet yes play a play um so yeah i mean it, it has this life that that just goes on and on do you want to add anything about i took all that sorry judy i took all that answer then um, I I'll just add one thing. In Peter Brook film, which Nicola's quite right, um, my father thought was absolutely marvellous, there's a moment where Roger, the dark character, um, who is, I think, inexplicable, and um, uh, I don't, you know, he just is. Um, the, the scene at the end where Piggy is killed and the rock is pushed by... Roger, um, my father said, looking at the actor's face, he said, I'm not sure I really should have allowed that child to experience that feeling. And who knows? I mean, the boy who played Roger, whose name was actually Roger, later wrote and said he found 
he felt that that process, the process of being in the film and having played that character had affected his life. Um, and I don't know what we do with that. I mean, you know, I don't know. It was another time, really. I mean, the film came out in 63, but it was made, I think, in 61. Um, and children were treated differently in those days, I think, I really think. Anyway, that's all I have to um, Can I follow up on that? Because one of the questions I had was about Lord of the Flies joins a small but very distinctive genre of adult books that are read mostly in schools and then often don't get reread. And and often, I, I mean, one of the things I think is uh, um, that I will do, because I confess I have not reread it since I was 14, is go back to it and see how it rereads as, as, as uh, uh, you know, a few years later. Um, so I just wondered, did, did he ever reflect on that? That the way in which that first novel, unlike all the others, became such a, uh, a, 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 a book that w was read in school primarily, and that you know was that was that was that the audience he was expecting? Was it an audience that he felt possibly was too young for it, or or uh, or that they would miss things? Oh, did 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 he reflect on that? Yes, he did. I think he was quite disturbed by the fact that it seemed to move further and further down. To begin with, it was an A-level text, and then it moved down to GCSE, and he remarks somewhere, I suppose eventually it will, you know, um, be circulating in playgroups. Um, and he, I think he did feel it was an adult book and it dealt with adult questions, but then children read adult books in school, quite rightly. I mean, Jane Eyre is an adult book and mm. many, many um, books on the syllabus now um, one might think of as being really quite troubling. Um, so, yes, I suppose he was disconcerted. Um, and he would have liked, and not so much for it not to be read in schools, but for people to read his other novels. He, he was frustrated by that, I think though always aware of how lucky he was. I don't know whether I've... No, that, 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 that's, that's a very good answer. And and yes, absolutely. I, I'm, I think it's important that difficult, troubling books are read at a, at a young age, but if they then get, as it were, stuck there, that's uh, uh, a little bit more uh, uh, concerning. Any Any other questions? Oh. The gentleman next to the lady who asked the first question. Did, did you not have your Did you have a question? No. No. So did you have a question? Oh, oh, did I? Did I ask it? Did I ask it in the same way? Or <laughs> I apologize. I shouldn't have put you on the spot there. I'm sorry. It's the same question for those of you online. Um uh, uh oh, there's a question there. Good. You don't want to hear my voice all the time. Hi, um, I was wondering how much research he had to do for either books like the double tongue about like the Pythia or just set in different places. Like would he go to the library and read about it or talk to experts or was it kind of just more focused on the story rather than a historical aspect of it? Oh, I think we'll probably do a double answer for this one. Um, I think something like The Inheritors, so the one I spoke about is second novel, and actually, when he writes this in 1955, the, the things we know about the Neanderthal people now were not known. So, for example, it has been proven now that we are related to Neanderthal, that at some point there's a shared ancestor. That wasn't known then. But remember, I mentioned hope in that book in which an entire civilization is destroyed. That's because the human beings take a Neanderthal baby. They bring this kind of life forward. So in terms of his research, I think a lot of the time he didn't do any because he wanted to let his imagination 
tell the story, not actual facts as well, because you know facts ruin fiction a lot of the time. And I think similarly for the spire, when he and he writes in a lot of detail about how one would build a spire, he said that, and he worked his classroom was opposite Salisbury Cathedral. So he was staring, I mean, obviously focusing on work, but also staring out the window at the cathedral spire. And he said that he went to the cathedral and just looked up and thought, how did that get there? So rather than doing lots of regions, he used those experiential moments and used his imagination to create. Judy? I think that's very true. And he, he took great glee in saying that he hadn't done research for the spire and he hadn't um, gone. In fact, he was quite knowledgeable about archaeology and um, had done a certain amount himself. And the Neanderthal situation, um, there had been earlier, I think in the 1920s, there'd been a Neanderthal grave. It was later that the Shanidar one was discovered. And he was absolutely cock a hoop about that. Although I gather now they, they don't now think that there were flowers left in the grave after all, which is very disappointing. But anyway, um, one book, well, set of books he did research for. These are exceptions in almost every way to my father's writing. They're the C trilogy. A, um, he always tried to write different books, different from the one before. The trilogy obviously is made up of three books that are in some ways similar. And B, they're all three very funny. Um, uh, they're dark as well. And he did a certain amount of research. He knew a huge amount about seamanship anyway. Uh, but he did some research about, you know, below decks in the early years of the 19th century and that sort of thing. And also, I think about the weather, the boat gets stuck in the Sargasso Sea. And I think he did find because he didn't like people after he'd published a book writing in saying, you know, you've got that on the port side when it should be on the starboard side, etc. Um, so for that, he did a bit of research, but Nicola is quite right. He really took it out of his head and put it on paper. And um, he regarded research in a sense as a little bit of a sort of kiss of death. You don't want to do too much of it because the book will die. So I think that was a very strong belief he had. And it's absolutely true about the spa. Um, and in fact, some people have said that it, it just wouldn't work. I mean, if taking these things up inside, that after a while, you know, the hole wouldn't be big enough. Because one of my tutors at um, university asked me about that, as if I was supposed to know. <laughs> um, so I said, oh, or something, you know, inappropriate. But generally, um, I think he thought the imagination was the thing. And if it wasn't in the imagination, it shouldn't really be there. For something like the double tongue, he already knew a huge amount about classical times and about, um, I mean, it's very influenced the double tongue by a play by Euripides, for example. And he'd read Euripides. I mean, famously, he read it for Lord of the Flies. Though I don't think it counted as research. I don't know. Anyway, that's probably too... <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Betty. Well, I was just wondering, where was this picture taken by Cecil Beaton? Can you tell us about it? Uh, yes. Uh, my dad, um, Cecil Beaton, had a stroke. Uh, he lived, I should explain. My parents lived in a little village called Bower Chalk in Wiltshire. Cecil Beaton lived in a village called Broad Chalk, which was two miles away down the river. Um, and Cecil Beaton sadly had a stroke, taught himself with great strength of mind to write with his left hand and to do various things, including going back to taking photographs. And he sent a message. I think his secretary rang up and said, um, I think he was Sir Cecil by then, uh, so, thought how wonderful you looked, which my father thought what does he want, you know, um, uh, would like to take some photographs. And so my dad went down to his house, which was called Reddish House, and was spectacularly beautiful. And this is the entrance to the garden room, not anything like a conservatory, a garden room. And there was a pond in the middle. 
and in between the pond and the living room, drawing room, was this beaded curtain. Now, actually, this photograph is enormously uncharacteristic of my father. He looks sort of piercing and gloomy and abstracted as if he's sort of peering through this veil. And I'm sure it was completely set up by Cecil Beaton who said, can you look like this, like this, like this. And actually he was a very jovial man and they had a very nice time. And despite my father's worst fears about how much it was going to cost, <laughs> Um, Cecil Wheaton gave him, I don't know, three or four photographs, one of which he gave to me, actually, um, for free, which was very generous of him. And I think this is a most beautiful, beautiful um, photograph, and we're allowed by his estate to use it wherever we like, which is very nice. So it was in Broadchalk at Reddish House. Question at the back. Um, you mentioned that um, one of one of the characters, I think Piggy, was um, largely informed by uh, Golding's dad, Alec. Uh, and I was wondering if there are any more characters, like prominent characters in um, his novels that were also maybe inspired by real life people close close to him. And if there are, um, how did they receive, you know, like seeing um, sort of themselves in in the characters? That's a marvellous question. Um, uh, Piggy, yes, was based on my grandfather, and so was the science teacher in Free Fall. There's another character in Free Fall called Philip something, who is based on a real character. My father refers to it. He dreams about this character, and he says he's the original of X in Free Fall, but I know nothing else about him, and I don't expect he ever read the book. The interesting um, real life thing I think is that in The Inheritors the two central characters the couple Loke and Far, the man and the woman the Neanderthal man the Neanderthal woman Arthur Kirstler said sort of teasingly once to my parents at one of these you know London literary parties oh they're the two of you you know in fact they are they're absolutely the spit of them and um, I'm sure Tara will bear this out, you know, some of the slight irritation that comes over far when Loke doesn't quite see something. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Um, whether my mother minded that, I mean, far is supremely practical, far more intelligent than her partner. If people had listened to her, perhaps the ne Neanderthals would have survived, but they don't. They don't. She's, you know, that is a new thing she's told in response to her really good idea, and a new thing is not a good idea. So I hope she was pleased with that portrait of her. She's also um, the woman that Sammy eventually marries in Free Fall, uh, who's described as the prettiest girl I ever saw. So I think she was probably quite pleased about that. Um, and it may be that she's the original of the young love Marilyn, Marion in the um, C trilogy. I, I don't recognize that portrait so much, but um, who knows, who knows? I can't offhand, I think on the way home of lots of people I haven't mentioned. <laughs> um, my grandfather never knew of his portrait as Nick Chales because he died before the book was published. But um, let's hope my mother was pleased with the way she was presented at any rate. And thank you very much. That was a lovely question. Okay, I think we are approaching 10 to nine. So I think this would be a time uh, to wrap up. And before we, we uh, thank our speakers, as I'm holding the microphone, um, I would like to highlight some of the talks that we have uh, lined up for the coming few months. Um, next month, we have uh, Sandra De Rocci from the University of Bath um, speaking about French women's writing after May 1968, so another uh, near contemporary uh, talk. That's on the 2nd of October. 
another Monday at 7.30. Um, in November, another colleague of ours at Bar Spa, uh, Dr. Stephen Moss, will be um, speaking on Mrs. Moreau's Warbler, How Birds Got Their Names, uh, and that's the 6th of November. And, uh, and then a heads up, it's not our part of our programme, but we claim it uh, for various reasons. Our Christmas lecture, which will be on the 13th of December, um, will be given by Professor Dinah Birch on Dickens and the Victorian Christmas book. And if you have any, uh, um, want any more information about that, look at our website or come and speak to Betty and myself afterwards. Um, if any of you have scribbled your emails, please make sure that you uh, hand us that piece of paper before uh, you leave. But it gives me enormous pleasure to thank our two speakers uh, today. Um, it's been a privilege, actually, to hear their uh, insights to um, the works of uh, William Golding and his life, obviously. Um, and, and I think what they've captured in the way that they've spoken insightfully and humanely about uh, um, uh, his life and his works, it leaves us, I think, as a professor of English literature with the best outcome. You go back and read the books you know, and you go and read some new books. And I think we can't really ask for more than that. So can we uh, all join me in a round of applause for our speakers?